Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Tuesday, June 12, 2012. This is the InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm your host, Aaron Dykes. Tonight, more troubling signs of an economic collapse as the EU discusses limiting withdrawals from ATM machines. Then, the people of North Dakota go to the polls to decide if the state should abolish property taxes, a measure predictably opposed by the State Chamber of Commerce, agribusiness, government unions, and the politicians. And of course, the establishment media is right there to demonize the Measure 2 proposal. Plus, a $175 million drone crashes in Maryland. And Adam Kokesh visits Aaron Dykes via video Skype. But we had to bleep out much of the mother conversation. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Tonight in the news, the European Union is planning a police state type lockdown. Kurt Nemo has the story about how European Union apparatchiks are planning currency controls in the event that Greece leaves the euro ahead of their vote coming up next week on June 17th. It is basically a scare tactic, but also another excuse for greater control. It's all being coordinated, of course, at the European Commission level. They're recommending everything from clamping down to ATMs and more. It's, of course, also in the Associated Press and other big wire news services. EU movement of money and people can be limited while the EU discusses, quote, limiting ATM withdrawals. On the one hand, this is the kind of bank holiday stuff Gerald Salente and other economic experts have been talking about for literally years now. On the other hand, it is what can we do to the people to make them not want countries to leave the Europe? It's to turn public tide against going against the EU, which is obviously authoritarian, they're openly so, and they're sending a signal to smaller nations not to buck the system, just to accept the austerity, accept the wage controls and everything else that comes with it. Well, what does that have to do with new border checks in European countries where they purposefully open up the borders, but now want to close them back down? It's all very interesting. That's brewing as they wait to see if the Syriza party, the left-leaning, far left-leaning Greek party will dominate the next election. Even if they're a strong second, it still may lead to renegotiation of the IMF deal that they've got going on there and more. Something to watch for. Of course, Italy just had a bank holiday yesterday. Spain is right in the middle of its big bailout deal. None of this is going to solve the problem other than to implement the austerity that the IMF, that the European Union Commission, and the other technocrats who converge around Bilderberg want. It's no coincidence this is all happening just after that big meeting. Uh, also, towns in Ireland where they're lined up for the bailout are going back to old currency. Not only does Greece have the drachma ready to go, uh, even Germany has the Deutschmark printed up just in case things go totally haywire. Meanwhile, on the war front in Syria, Russia is sending new attack helicopters to Syria. They've already sent them all kinds of equipment. Russia has its only big military base in the Middle East on the Mediterranean Sea right there in Syria. So you can't separate the big bear from the Syrian tension. And you also can't separate it from Iran, Turkey, any of it. They're saying all of them could enter into a war if it becomes a protracted civil war. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who's been weeping under, over the deaths and saying how horrible it is, is now concerned about the latest information about the attack helicopters, saying it will escalate quite dramatically the conflict there. Well, obviously, they're planning for a war. They're trying to make it look like the West or the good guys, like NATO has to intervene because it's such a crisis there. But we knew all along it was just the next domino to fall. It is part of the, quote, path to Persia. We know they want a war with Iran sometime. The question is, how do they get there? Well, you have to deal with Syria, Hezbollah, and the rest of it first. And these tensions are right there. Of course, Basma Kodmani, a big Ford Foundation, United Nations, Western operative, was just at the Bilderberg meeting. Another big, big signs that those tensions are about to escalate into all-out war or another Libya style intervention where tens of thousands die, uh, but it's somehow still humanitarian, not a war, maybe kind of a 
kinetic action. Interesting news in North Dakota. They're voting today. We will see probably tomorrow whether or not this passes a measure to dump property taxes. And all the officials there are freaking out. They're saying this is going to destroy the government. What will they do? Well, they have other ways of raising funds. Uh, I'm not an expert on this issue, but clearly property taxes does get in the way of our property rights, part of that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness guaranteed to us under the Constitution. I think it's a hopeful move that they're going for measure two to do away with property taxes, fund the government in other ways. North Dakota really, I think, has one of the smallest governments. I'm not real close to the ground there, uh, but it certainly has one of the more marginal populations, a lot of spread out land, and not a big dependency class. Can you imagine if they tried to do this in New York or California or something? It would be outrageous, but at the same time, isn't it kind of crazy they were able to put property taxes on us in the first place? It's really liberty restricting. Hopeful that that's even on the ballot. Who knows if it's going to pass. Meanwhile, the drones continue to be a big overall issue, and now the drone program run by Customs and Border Protection, supposedly patrolling our borders, uh, which are not really patrolled or controlled, has now turned into its own controversy. It's in the Washington Times about how Homeland Security has ordered so many drones they can't keep track of them all. They don't have a good plan for how to use them. It's all been revealed by this new audit. Well, they're talking about nine drones going on 10. That takes what maybe 30, 40, 50 personnel to run. I don't know exactly, but it's pretty clear they never were even serious about enforcing the border. We know that from 100 different ways to Sunday. They're not really trying to stop the flow of drugs by cartels across the Mexican border. Fast and Furious ties into all that. It's just more of the, dro uh, of the drone joke as they bring drones into the mainstream, but also try to act like it's gonna help with enforcement, when clearly it's not, it's admitted there. Also, a drone has crashed over Maryland. It's apparently a U.S. Navy drone. They don't officially acknowledge any of the drones that are used for foreign policy purposes, but uh, one has crashed in Maryland, raising new questions and just raising bigger questions about what's going to happen when there's tens of thousands of them in the skies, run by local police departments, various federal agencies, for all kinds of different purposes. This stuff is getting out of control in a hurry, and we just have to keep an eye on it. Also in the news, Bill Gates has stuck his little plum pink finger in everything. He wants to run the eugenics programs. He wants to tell you when to take vaccines. He wants to push GMOs on farmers in the third world here in North America. He knows best because he made money on software he got you to buy that was knowingly uh, not good enough and would have to be updated constantly. Well, now he has another great plan. Uh, believe it or not, you can't make this stuff up, says the Washington Post. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is spending about $1.1 million to develop a new way to physiologically measure how engaged students are by their teachers' lessons. It's a galvanic skin response bracelet that they would have to wear in order to be measured. Now, uh, let's cut to a clip of one of Bill Gates' other classic programs, the Teachers for Old Ladies plan. Uh, it definitely has eugenics on it. It's part of this larger Time Magazine How to Die program, getting us to accept end-of-life care, so-called death panels. Let's play that clip. Would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade-off in medical costs? But that's called the death panel. Uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. So there's not enough money for education, supposedly. So he says, let's just go along with killing granny. That way we can hire 10 new teachers. But, oh, oh, now we got to get these high-tech bracelets. Uh, so let's fire the teachers again. I mean, what other way could they have to make the already prison-like public schools seem more creepy and more prison-like than to have a tracking bracelet on every student to see if they're paying attention? Now you don't have a right to snooze off in your lesson and get bad grades? I mean, this is ridiculous, but it's all part of Bill Gates trying to take over education, agriculture, everything. This so-called philanthropy is really getting out of control as a big monopolistic policy-setting measure. It's part of his Measuring Effective Teachers projects. Well, they already have all these standardized tests that are full of flaws and aren't really teaching kids, and that alone has every reason to be criticized. But Bill Gates is also re-educating people in agriculture departments in schools, both university and statewide, at the public school, K-12 through level. I mean, it's really strange, and this is just 
an over-the-top, bizarre measure he's put forward. And he's had a lot of those. His foundation funds all kinds of things, but the worst part is their grants are only to get these programs started. He's going to test and decide how to develop these biometric, galvanistic bracelets that'll see if students are paying attention, but then who will actually fund paying for those bracelets to go on the wrist of each kid? Well, it'll be these already underfunded school districts. Not the best idea. We turn now to the quote of the day. Ancient Rome declined because it had a Senate. Now what's going to happen with us having both a House and a Senate? That's Will Rogers, the singing cowboy. That is it for tonight's news segment. We turn now to another segment from Planet InfoWars. Yes, it's the social network where you can ask Alex, you can sign up, you can network with people and fight the InfoWar your way. Stay tuned. After the break, we have an interview with Adam Kokesh coming up. But first, those questions with Alex. Hey, I'm Christy Hightower reporting for Planet InfoWars. I'm here with Alex Jones answering your questions from the Ask Alex group on the InfoWars. Um, Alex, first question comes to you as uh, 4RP 2012. He says, hi, Alex. Um, thanks for your site and all that you do. I was wondering, should we be taking even more precautions against radioactive fallout? Do the events that are unfolding, say, in Michigan and Indiana, specifically, what supplements should we be taking? I purchased potassium iodide, um, but I'm not sure if I should be taking the, that right now, or does anyone know about these isotopes? Well, that's a good question. Fukushima is raining a lot of radiation down, much bigger than Chernobyl, but the media and FDA and people say it's good for you. Uh, but no, I, I'm not going to give medical advice, but from the doctors we've had on, just read the insert. If there's a big meltdown in your area, and we're just getting smaller amounts of fallout, it's still you know big for happening all the way in Japan, but, but if there was larger fallout and they break down how many rads of certain uh, you know types of radiation, then you would take it to fill your thyroid with the good iodine. Separately from that, a good seaweed uh, supplement that fills your thyroid beforehand with the right type of iodine will block the radioactive iodine and other things from being able to fill up your thyroid. But again, I'm not giving medical advice here. Look it up for yourself. Uh, I have started supplementing with uh, brown kelp seaweed. And I'm also taking some of the longevity products from InfoWarsTeam.com. Um, and I've not moved my children out of the United States, uh, even though I could go to the Southern Hemisphere, and they would have about half the background radiation level uh, that we have here in this hemisphere because of Chernobyl and now Fukushima and other events. Uh, I've decided, I guess, to stay here. Uh, but it's a very, very scary trend that more and more of the system is implying that you know, higher levels of radiation is not a big deal. It's kind of like depleted uranium, which they wouldn't let the military use until 1990. They had it back in the 50s, well, really the 40s, but they said in those reports you can't use it because it ignites going down the barrel. You get some of the uh, heavy metal and it, its toxicity, and it's also radioactive. But by 1990, they said, hell, let's go ahead and use this. The toxic waste left over from nuclear weapons production and other things. So that's a big issue, a big problem uh, that we're uh, uh, facing there, that the system has just decided that radiation is not a problem, that radiation uh, is not a big deal. This question comes to you from user Adam. He says, uh, hey, Alex, I was wondering if you had any insights into the Port Arthur massacre that happened in Australia back in 1996. Um, I think that it was tragic, but it looks like it was staged by the New World Order um, to disarm Australia and uh, by introducing uniform gun laws. So I was wondering if you have ever studied this event in your work or if there's any, anything you have to say since there were inconsistencies in the official story. All of these mass shootings that we've seen, all of them, the person has been under psychiatric care and has been connected to different secret societies, the Masons. They had a similar one that happened in Scotland that they used to basically ban guns across the UK around a similar time. Uh, this event uh, killed 35 people. The whole thing was very, very suspicious. The police stood down, uh, and we saw the uh, Columbine shooting with Harris and Kleibold uh, and all the weird connections and the school being half empty, and they got 126 bombs out of the building, and the SWAT team admitted they'd shot some people. This was all in the news, and the uh, sheriff and the school administrators were meeting at a Subway sandwich place while this was happening. And, and there was this huge stand down. The witnesses saw other people. 
these do have all the hallmarks of a false flag event. Uh, Harrison Kleibold had shot a movie months before that the school sponsored of the basketball diaries where they're shooting everyone in the school. And then what you do is you get people to play along in a drill that now we're going to do a safety drill. You shoot a bunch of people and then have footage of Harrison Kleibold walking around on the surveillance tapes. So if you look at that, I'd say about a 95% chance that was staged. We know they had prior knowledge. We know people aided them. But 95% chance it was completely staged. Port Arthur, we're not as sure, but it's got the same uh, earmarks. And a lot of these other events uh, do look like uh, shy ops. I mean, Gulf of Tonkin was staged. Operation Ajax to overthrow Iran in 53 was staged. So many other events have been staged that this is exactly the type of stuff the anti-gun lobby uh, engages in with criminal elements. Here's a great example of a false flag staged terror attack. It wasn't just the ATF with Fast and Furious three years ago letting guns be sold at gun shops to trace them. That was their cover when it started coming out in federal court. It was their day one. We we broke at Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com and now PlanetInfowars.com. Uh, what really you know happened there because it was in federal courts in January of 2011 that the U.S. government was shipping drugs in through Sinaloa and other cartels and shipping them guns, but also to Honduras, not just Mexico, and to cities inside the U.S. like Tampa, uh, areas uh, not just in Tampa, but also uh, up in uh, Indiana. So government criminal elements that are controlling the drug trade. And that was done, the memos later came out, CBS News covered it, to blame the Second Amendment. So they ship guns into Mexico, call the Civil War down there and the drug war, the fault of America. And even though they got caught, the Attorney General still came out, Eric Holder, who's been caught in perjury, and said, we need to ban semi-autos. We need to restrict how many guns you can buy because of what happened in Mexico. So we know they do false flags. That is a great question. I'm not 100% sure on that particular massacre, what back in 1996. Mm -hmm. So they just basically do this to take away liberties and force you into being scared to give them up, basically? Yes, they have these big media events. I mean, they have mass shootings sometimes that are real, but it doesn't get much attention because the government and media weren't basically already primed to make a big issue out of it. I mean, there are some real events. Right. Um, you know, sometimes a Palestinian woman goes on a bus with a hidden gun and shoots 10 people or stabs them, you know, things like that. Uh, there are occasional real shootings at workplaces. You know, the, the old thing of going postal, got a bunch of, you know, vets. Some of them have got post-traumatic stress disorder. They've killed people before. They've crossed that threshold. Their boss keeps you know, doing stuff to them. They go crazy. Instead of committing suicide, they go to work and shoot 10 people. Those are real. They don't get any attention. Upper, we protested Bilderberg in Fairfax County, uh, I was reminded of a report where six cops got shot when a teenager went in and killed him. Because that was real, and because it showed the state isn't really powerful, almost no coverage. So the telltale sign is they're in psychiatric care. There's more shooters than were originally thought. Mm -hmm. The people thought they were taking part in a drill, doing a movie shoot, mm -hmm. which we know was on record they were doing, as a cover. 7-7, the London bombings came out was a government event. Um, I mean, that's even mainstream news that... A SWAT, the MI6 agent, was leading the group. They thought it was a drill of taking backpack bombs on the trains and buses. And then later it came out the exact same bus and trains. There was a drill of them being attacked at the exact same time, exact same location. So see, it, it's always those key earmarks. Yeah. No, great questions. In fact, we were talking before we taped this that uh, yeah, that uh, this is in the section uh, at planetinfowars.com, the Ask Alex. Ask Alex group, absolutely. So and again, folks, there's a few bugs with the site. That's why it's in beta. It's getting very, very popular, but we're working with database folks. So thank you for being part of it. Uh, and I'm now ranting. We're only into question number two. <laughs> uh, Christy, continue here. All right. So uh, the next question comes to you from Glenn. And he says, uh, Alex, I've been curious. What ever happened to TV Westerns? Um, you know, the, the cowboys come on with their guns. They fight the bad guys. Um, I don't see that anymore. Is that just a trend or was this a psych op or was this some sort of pressure to take these off to kind of, you know, take away the little boy heroes of the cowboys? And now all we see are the police, like a lot of cop dramas. So is that to familiarize us with a police state or like the idea of yes. being comfortable? Again, uh, this, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, this question is excellent. There's actually been books written and Hollywood's actually admitted, especially under J. Edgar Hoover, but it got worse after that. But he started it. 
everything was basically government approved that had the FBI or any federal police involved in it. And of course, a new movie came out that was directed um, by uh, Clint Eastwood, you know, breaking that down about J. Edgar Hoover. It's very accurate from my research. And it's expanded since then where you can get free tanks, free helicopters, aircraft carriers, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars of, 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 of value uh, of production uh, you know, perks. I'm trying to think of the exact Hollywood word they use. But the, but the point is, is that is that you can get half your budget if you put certain messages in your film. The Pentagon will pay for it. The Pentagon will let you use their equipment. They will give you advisors, but they've got to approve the script. Well, it's expanded into what I call propaganda placement. Now, the media now admits it is going on and calls it uh, behavior placement. And so when you see a billboard for join the military in a movie, or when you see, when you're watching basketball or football, and they make a basket or a touchdown, and it always cuts the military mm -hmm. and the audience, mm -hmm. that's to create a Pavlovian response where you ring a bell. Right, and, and then, drooling. <laughs> and, and, then, and then feed the dog the, the, the steak. Right. Exactly. Well, wow, you're excited there's a basket cut to the troops. So everything is, a, oh, troops are good. And again, it's not that the troops are even bad, it's that the troops are used to sell the global agenda. And Westerns were something that was in the American psyche from the 1860s and 70s on because there were bigger wars with the Indians and everything in the Midwest and the East that made wars out West look tame. I mean, there were fights with 100,000 Indians against, you know, 30,000 troops, you know, things that went on over five state areas, whole towns massacred on both sides. I mean, there was stuff that's never been in movies. It's only in books because that was never popularized in newspaper serials in you know the 1790s, the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s. The West was really won by Western expansion in the East and the Plains areas and the Midwest by the 1850s. But then it was popularized in culture of the out west battle and the romanticism of that when they were i mean believe me and i'm not saying the apaches weren't tough but it was nothing compared to some of the giant wars that happened in the midwest i mean just huge wars where tens of thousands were killed every few months but now i'm digressing off into history to answer the question the reason westerns were so big on the psyche is it was the you know western bravado a militarized country uh you know the tough guys out there on their own against the elements that was mainly because it was popular and John Ford and others knew that's what was selling. And so it wasn't really propaganda, uh, the Westerns. You're right, though. They didn't like that rugged individualistic attitude. They liked the militarized attitude. So they segued towards the heroes only being the police. And they're the only heroes in America. And it creates you know, almost like a, 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 a mental illness now where we think America is only the troops and only the police which is really something right out of fascist societies like Nazi Germany. Not saying the military themselves or the police are bad, but that in a sick society going into a fascist or authoritarian model for that matter, you start seeing nothing but police and flags and checkpoints and black mask and well now drones in the sky and oh hey, we are spying on you. Uh, this is turning into a whole show of its own. That, uh, <laughs> given but, the fact that they're taking away the individual like ruggedness kind of idea, the, the cowboy was like out to, to uphold his own rights and now it's like only if you follow orders and you're part of a, a crew of police or military then that's there you that, go that ultimately the sum up of it like the idea that the individual is no longer got his own rights and christy i think you said it all in 10 <laughs> seconds when i took 20 minutes we're gonna start cutting alex's rants to just christy <laughs> i think that's a better idea this was your idea about ask alex we'll just have christy all right, Alex, we've got to make this quick. You've got other things you have to do, so let's let's keep it short. All right. Um, all right. Robert Victor asks you, um, does anyone know where the money from the IMF Global and the money from the Morgan Chase has gone? Um, or is it just disappeared and ended up in somebody's pocket? Well, the government knows where $1,000 you get paid goes, but they just can't figure it out, and they have no idea, kind of like the $2.3 trillion that was missing on September 10th, 2001, that we never heard about. And last time I heard, it's over $5 trillion missing from the Pentagon. Uh, so that's why things are so corrupt. You're being watched yeah. under a magnifying glass, but the banksters and the government crooks, well, they don't know where the trillions are. Of course not. And if you don't like it, a drone will drop by. <laughs> Say hi.
Um, all right, so user Chris <laughs> says, uh, hey, Alex, been a long a longtime fan. Um, I was wondering, how do you manage to keep from just exploding? I mean, every day I do more research, I see more documentaries, and uh, and it just gets harder from to, to not be sick and just upset. So how do you keep from just losing it? <laughs> we are turning the corner here, and I've studied history. Things always get really bad before they get better. The old saying of it's always darkest for the dawn. We don't have a choice but to resist this, or our children have no future. I mean, it really goes back to that. And I've seen success when we fight tyranny. We've just got to get more people involved doing it and realizing it's a process. That doesn't mean you compromise. People say, well, that means compromise. No, 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 no. It's a process in resisting and never compromising because defeat is in compromise. You can't compromise with a private fellow reserve conquering your, your country. It's a fraud. You can't compromise with cancer viruses added to the vaccine. You can't compromise with a so-called government caught doing all these secret tests on our own troops. You can't compromise with evil. You can't compromise with cancer. This is not like we're having a debate with somebody. This is a scientific dictatorship and we're gonna kick their butt. Nice, <laughs> very nice. Uh, okay, so Georgia Boy asks, um, it's interesting how that Ron Paul, Rand Paul mess happened just days after Bilderberg 2012. Um, uh, I've also noticed, as you've stated, a dwindling communication coming from the Paul campaign in recent months. So do you believe that the Paul family's well-being might have been threatened, similar to, say, Ross Perot when he was running, he dropped out? You know, Paul had to know he was getting into. And again, the Pauls aren't our enemies. They've done a lot of good work. It's just, this is a real departure. They coordinated that announcement uh, with Paul coming out that same day last Thursday and saying, hey, I'm not going to uh, you know, try to challenge the delegates anymore. We've lost, but not saying it officially. And then Rand coming out and saying, I endorse Romney. I mean, what did they expect was gonna happen? Ron Paul did endorse McCain four years ago. So that's why people are hurt. And then their response is, by some of their surrogates is, hey, you know, I saw an article today in uh, the New Jersey newspaper saying, hey, you're stupid uh, and you need to grow up. So we need to grow up and like Mitt Romney and, and you know what, like a flip-flopping liar. Well, know what? We'll just let you guys go over and be with your Republicans and hang out at the country club. You're just mainline Republicans now. It doesn't mean Ron Paul's totally done that, but with the direction Rand's going with sanctions on Iran and you know, talking about fantasies about the hero doctor that helped locate bin Laden and all this stuff. I mean, they're starting to play politics more, and that's okay. Uh, it, it hurts because we've supported them so much and they've done so much good, uh, but now we just have to worry about not letting this demoralize us and just moving forward. Right. Um, on that note, actually, there have been a lot of users commenting that uh, Governor Gary Johnson um, is one of those that potentially he's running with the Libertarian Party, um, is there some sort of guest you want to bring in? Like, do you want to bring him in as a guest or? Well, it's funny the person asked this question because I haven't even read all these before we started taping this here, <laughs> as we taped to air. Uh, I uh, already have him coming on Thursday. He's been on before. And again, we don't, here first. <laughs> we don't think he's going to win, uh, but, he's gonna, but he can inject some ideas outside of the two-party mafia system. We had Jesse Ventura uh, on today. What's the next one? Right. Um, all right. Shane uh, Yickel asks, uh, what's your opinion of Hustler founder Larry Flint and his contributions to the First Amendment and free speech? Well, I've talked to one of the main guys over there. You know, Hustler's published three or four of our articles. How many is it, Aaron? Three or four, I don't know, at least three. And when they call them and say, can we publish your article about 9-11? Can we publish your article about this? I say, sure. Awesome. Because it's just getting the info out to people. That's one of the biggest magazines in the country. Yeah. It's bigger than Playboy. Uh, magazines aren't what they used to be with the internet, but it's popular. Uh, I don't particularly like uh, how that exploits everybody. I see it as exploitive, but I wouldn't want to trample on their First Amendment. Uh, and I think you know it, it's a mixed bag. He, Larry Flint's come out against the private Federal Reserve. Uh, I, I happen to talk to folks at their offices. They say Larry Flint does listen to the show sometimes and has seen the films. So we are influencing Larry Flint. Uh, I think you know, the things he does moral that, that some would see as morally objectionable. You know, Mitt Romney calls the cops on neighbors smoking pot legally in California every time they smoke it. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's robbing old ladies' pension funds and getting banker bailouts. So there's this fake moralizing I always see by the really corrupt, and, and they're not even being hypocrites. They use it as a shell, as a front. Look, I'm all clean cut, and I call the cops on my neighbor for smoking pot. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, they're involved getting banker bailouts and and and, and promoting wars in police state. Uh, so uh, I don't agree with a lot of what Larry Flint does, but uh, you know he's not really uh, 
something that's on my radar screen. And I think overall, I've seen him come some way towards reality. Um, so, it's, so it's a complex question, but that's my view on Larry Flint. So hi, Larry. <laughs> well, that's it for the Ask Alex questions. Thank you again, Alex Jones, for answering these. And keep them coming in the Ask Alex group on Planet InfoWars. That's right. And this is really... Our second one, we shot one on an iPhone the other day that hasn't aired yet. So the first installment will air as the second installment tomorrow. <laughs> but tonight there's this lengthy installment. And uh, Christy's also going to be doing a few times a week reports on planetinfowars.com, planetinfowars.com, we should add, uh, where she reviews the articles, poetry, groups, whatever you're doing. So watch prisonplanet.tv and then the YouTube channels for that as well. And we've got to go because Aaron has got to get from behind the camera <laughs> and get in there and start getting ready to cover the news you're going to see this on. So we'll see you. We'll say bye, Christy. Bye. Thank y'all. <laughs>
But we need to look at what the avenue to power is in the current structure in that the sheeple have invested so much power in the two-party system that we have to acknowledge the reality of that. And while I would love for the Libertarian Party to be a viable force, you see with Gary Johnson, we nominated someone this year who isn't quite a philosophical libertarian, and that's a lot, lot, really disappointing. And there's a lot of missed potential there, especially in the year of Obamacare versus Romney care. It's a great opportunity to be the libertarian candidate if only we had a true libertarian. So I think we can keep working within the Republican Party because the fundamental split between the two parties is bigger government or smaller government. And while I am absolutely committed to my principles and staying absolute to those and, and making sure that people that I trust to work with are people who share those values, the idea of forming coalitions and being allies with people who disagree with you is essential to making change. And I think working within the Republican Party gives us a way of doing that as well as taking over this mechanism of power. And it's happening anyways. You know, the libertarian movement is going to be manifest one way or another eventually politically. It's just a matter of by what mechanism. And if the Republican Party provides the most effective mechanism, I don't have a problem with that. I'll just always be a libertarian who happens to be a Republican and not the other way around. Well, I'm anything but inside uh, the Ron Paul group. I'm not inside the party. I'm not part of the behind the scenes strategy, but certainly it felt like a kick in the stomach this week, at least from where I sit. Why did Rand position himself as though he were inheriting his father's ideas if he never was that person? Why didn't he platform on that? And furthermore, why didn't he ask Romney if he wanted the endorsement to publicly show he was moving towards uh, some of the better ideas rather than further towards the Obama center? Oh, man. Well, I, it, it really shouldn't have been a kick in the nuts. I, I, hate, I hate to say that you were duped. You know, you were duped by, by Rand in that sense. And you said position himself as if he was the inheritor of Ron's legacy. And he never was. He never has been. And he kind of led people along with that and let people think that by his last name that he didn't fall far from the tree. But he obviously fell pretty far and rolled a ways downhill. So he's always been a conservative and not a libertarian and, and he's never identified as a libertarian so I, I think it's important to to keep that perspective and and there are a lot of people with different reasons and, and speculations as to why but there are lots of people besides rand who are trying to co-opt the liberty movement they just see that rand is the easiest way in and you look at people like jack hunter who's also uh, a conservative who, who got himself weaseled into the campaign as the official blogger, thanks to a, a bad hiring decision, or perhaps a good hiring decision by Jesse Benton, who is the main leech on Ron Paul. And it remains to be seen just how self-motivated Jesse Benton is, whether it was his own scheming that led him to subvert the Ron Paul campaign for his own benefit, or if it was outside forces, possibly led, manipulated by Trig V. Olson, the famous interventionist of the International Republican Institute. You know, so it, it really, time will tell, but if, if nothing else, this is kind of separating the core of the movement from those who would try to co-opt it the way that the Tea Party was co-opted. Well, I just know I want to be part of the tireless minority who never stops fighting for principles, whether I'm right or wrong about those you principles. Know, it's not, it's but, not going to be that way, man. It's not going to be that way because you know what? Sooner or later, we're going to be the majority. And you have that to look forward to. Well, we'll see what happens. Politics is a very disgusting business, and, and I, for one, would like to stay far away from it. But, of course, we do need people inside the system. We want to win allies, work with people. Uh, you know, it's just an interesting week. Let's put it that way. Where do things go forward for your movements, for the people you work with? Uh, I, you've been leading troops for Ron Paul and, and uh, different events as well. Tell us about some of that. Well, we've been kind of holding back, and it's been tough to see what's going on, what, Ron's Paul, what Ron Paul's plans are for the RNC. And this is still the million-dollar question. What is the end for Ron? What is the goal going to the RNC with a, with, with a few hundred delegates, as he'll have? What does he actually want to do? Is it to just sort of hang out and make a statement and vaguely support his son's efforts? Is it to change the platform, get a speaking spot? If he does, what's he going to say? So our original strategy of playing into the Ron Paul campaign strategy of winning over delegates 
of swaying delegates of the RNC, of encouraging our stealth delegates, and of making the statement that Ron Paul is the choice of the troops. You know, we, we're, we're adapting from that, and, and there's a lot going on. There's been some drama in the organizing, as there always is for things like this. People have been holding back, waiting to see what Ron is going to do, waiting to see how it's going to shake out with the campaign. And so Paul Festival now is officially on for August 24th through the 26th, which is the weekend before the convention. And we're going to be there, Veterans for Ron Paul. We're going to be a presence the entire time. We're going to have uh, our own special presentation on Sunday evening, which will be part of the, uh, the grand finale of Paul Festival. Uh, but the real grand finale for the Ron Paul Revolution, for the movement, and for, uh, uh, you know, at least what we see as Ron Paul's career here will be on Monday the 27th. And at noon, we're going to be stepping off and leading a march in formation, Veterans for Ron Paul. And we want to see the entire Ron Paul army there with us. We are inviting everyone who wants to join us in saluting Ron Paul to be there on the 27th. Now, Ron has said in his own words to be respectful at the convention. So we're not going to go to disrupt or at least we're not calling on people to do that. People can do that on their own. Uh, obviously, I, I did it myself in 2008, interrupting John McCain. But um, we're going to honor Ron's request on this point and march up unpermitted because Ron has also taught us to assert our rights. So the only permit for this march will be the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. If we end up protesting H.R. 347 as a result, the Buildings and Grounds Act that illegal uh, made certain forms of protest in Secret Service areas illegal, well, then so be it. We're going to be protesting that, too. But we're really here to honor Ron Paul, to show the world the size of the army that he has inspired. And while we're going to be marching eight miles through the Florida heat, there will be opportunities to join us along the way or at the RNC for those members of the Ron Paul Army that aren't quite up on their physical training. But we will be going to make a statement to show the GOP establishment that we are the future of the party, that the neocons will have to acknowledge Ron Paul is the choice of the troops, and we will pay our respects to Ron Paul for the countless sacrifices that he has made in the cause of liberty. And I can't think of a more fitting tribute than this, that we have a massive formation march from the state fairgrounds to the Tampa Times Forum to salute Ron Paul. Uh, let me add this constructively. What about people who have the view of, no, don't not turn over the apple cart? What about saying, no, obviously the parties are corrupt. Let's, we don't want this. We want something that isn't the current GOP party. I know you're saying they're the future, how do you get that message across without necessarily disrupting? Obviously, we don't want riots. We don't want more reason for them to send in uh, people in black masks and batons and, and, and grenades and less lethal weapons or something. But how do we send the message that what's going on now is not acceptable? We don't want Obama. We don't want Obamney. Well, if an idea comes to the surface between now and then and someone says, hey, this is how we do it with riot shields and pitchforks, uh, you know, I, as long as we don't violate the non-aggression principle, I'm open to considering anything. But I think that what, what we can start with doing is mustering our forces, making sure that we have a massive show of numbers there. And I think that's enough to scare the establishment. But more importantly, we're already taking over the Republican Party. We don't have to disrupt it. We don't have to destroy it. We are taking it over from the bottom up. And the sad thing is, man, it's really not that hard. You know, I, I, can, I was just brainstorming the other day, you know, what would I do with a million dollars, one of those kinds of exercises. And if I could hire, I mean, with a million dollars, you could hire 40 organizers, probably 50, one for every state as a full-time organizer to recruit people to go into the Republican Party meetings at the county level and take over. I mean, most of these things at their monthly meetings, they only have like 15, 20 people. To actually outnumber them, take it over and make it fun to be a Republican again, like to make it an exciting party that's fueled by the youth movement around Ron Paul, like, I think that's what's already happening. Now, whether that's going to be sustainable or not, we'll see. But obviously, the party is changing from the bottom up. And we're just going to show the world, hey, what you see inside the Tampa Times Forum, that's the past and the corrupt present. What you see outside marching for Ron Paul, that's the future. Is there anything that's going to go on with the delegates Ron Paul does have at the state or at the RNC level in terms of changing the platform or saying, no, this block does not go along with what's happening. Is there any kind of message like that that you see coming out? 
Not that I know of. And again, that's part of the million dollar question for Ron, what he's actually going to direct his delegates to do with the RNC other than be respectful. But most of these things are winner take all votes. So I really don't see the Ron Paul delegates being able to affect significant change unless it's on party platform issues, which are, of course, as we know, are pretty much irrelevant. Sure. But in the circumstance where you have you know, minus the Ron Paul people, a 50-50 split in the, in, in, in the rest of the delegation. And, you know, they, they don't know which way they want to go. And there's a big government, small government way about it. Then, yeah, maybe the Ron Paul delegates there will be able to vote one way or the other and affirm that the party in its platform is moving in a smaller government direction. If Ron Paul marshals his forces to do that, he must see some value in it. I don't, but if he does, I trust him to at least support him in that effort and, and encourage delegates to be a part of whatever he has plan, but also to be ready with whatever it is that you want to do to represent yourself as a delegate at the RNC. Yeah, more specifically, what, what do you see that as being? <laughs> well, I'm not going to call on people to disrupt uh, in the way that I did in 2008. As, as you know, I had a sign that said, Ron Paul, excuse me, John McCain votes against vets and you can't win an occupation. But if delegates are able to make a statement like that, in a way that is respectful by whatever definition they want to apply, I encourage people to do that. This is the chance to have your voice heard when the whole world will turn its eyes to Tampa Bay. So do something to be visible. If you can do it respectfully, that's usually better than doing it disrespectfully. But the most important thing is to make a powerful statement for liberty. I agree, and I, I definitely think we have to remember we're all individuals in this fight for liberty. It's always been bigger than any one person, and that, of course, includes Ron Paul. Anything else you'd like to bring up today, Adam? Well, I just have a fun event planned, and i got to get in a plug for Porkfest, because Porkfest is next week, and there's a lot of people here on the East Coast really looking forward to that. People flying in from all over the country. That's going to be in Lancaster, New Hampshire, Porkfest.com, so check it out. But on my way home to Arlington, Virginia from Lancaster, we're going to be stopping by Middleborough, Massachusetts, because just last week, Middleborough, Massachusetts approved legislation that empowers cops to fine you $20 for swearing in public. I mean, this incredible bull statism is un believable. This disgusting disregard for the, 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 the freedom of speech that our founders fought for is now being destroyed in Massachusetts. So the home of the Tea Party of all places. So we're going to be going there on Monday afternoon, right around lunchtime and having a free speech demonstration in the middle of the town of Middleborough and an act of civil disobedience. So we've got a Facebook page going up for that right now. It's free speech demonstration. So check that out. It'll be available on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Kokesh for Congress, or you search for Adam Kokesh or Adam versus the man. And the website for that is Adam versus the man.com. But you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to be involved in independent media with people like you. It's an honor to be included in the InfoWars nightly news as a, an almost regular guest. You know, it's, it's great to see that we have a, a, a really, I don't want to say a tight knit movement, but a movement of people with an incredibly deep mutual respect because we stick to our principles. Well, it's a filthy mouth you have, but any friend of the First Amendment's a friend of mine. Uh, good to have you on, Adam, and uh, we will indeed talk to you in the future. And that's well, it you, for tonight. You're, you're surprised that, are you, that the, in the Marines you learn how to cuss like a sailor? Oh, I'm just teasing. I'm, I'm not an angel either, so. Thanks for tuning in. That's it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. We'll be back again tomorrow.